<laughs> I'm Freddie Silver, and you're listening to Alien Theorists Theorizing. Welcome to Alien Theorist Theorizing. This is our Theorists in the Desert interview series, uh, number four. I'm Brayden. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And that up there is the man, the myth, the legend, Freddie Silva. Third time on the show. Uh, we should we, we should <laughs> got him a special shirt or something. He's the only he's the only two time guest and the only three time guest. Oh my God! Have they all survived? <laughs> well, yeah, you're the you're this by far the most rich. requested guest we've had by far so yeah thanks for coming back on the show freddie we appreciate it oh my pleasure thank you so now just uh just to start it off what's the catalyst that got you started down your path as a writer researcher investigator photographer what, what got you going uh, free drinks <laughs> um, and the fact that uh, we all seem to be born to do something in our lives and some people are very lucky they find it very early on I was drawing pyramids when I was three so obviously something was not right with this person they didn't quite belong in the normal world and um, yeah I just basically uh, went into uh, co the commercial world Every time I got laid off, I'd go back to reading books about pyramids and other things I collected. And, um, you know, a leap of faith. I started researching crop circles, and my first book was a international bestseller. And I haven't stopped working ever since for about 25 years. So it's been a wonderful little journey of exploration. Yeah, the crop circles is what how we found you. And then, yeah, you've written five other books since then. And today we're going to be talking about your newest work, Missing Lands. So, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit on our own, but we obviously do not do the research that you do. So take us back, take us back to you know, the cataclysm 12,000 years ago and uh, let's go through it. Absolutely. I mean, we, do, we have nothing to complain about today. I mean, nope. back then these people were dealing with burning mountains coming out of the sky and uh, creating waves which uh, were, they crossed the Himalaya, which means that these things were over uh, three miles high. And there's actually evidence to back this up now. Uh, of all places, the Los Alamos uh, Laboratory, where they actually simulated a uh, half a mile rock coming out of the sky, hitting the coast of Peru. And yes, you will get a three mile high, high tsunami. So why would the ancestors be lying? Uh, that's what got me excited about the, the, the book, about the fact that uh, these people weren't just making up myths, they were actually recounting eyewitness accounts. And, uh, you know, we've all heard about Atlantis, we've heard about Lemuria, and I always wondered, have we thought about this too much? Uh, have we blinkered ourselves into a corner where we think that that was the only two missing lands where the gods used to reside? It turns out um, there were a lot more. There are at least eight uh, other places, and they all behave like islands. Uh, even in the Andes, there's a place that was that actually an island of the gods in the middle of Lake Titicaca, still partly there. And uh, But more importantly, I wanted to find out who these people were. Uh, we, we hear about the Anunnaki and uh, all these other people in Viracocha and so forth. Were they all connected? Were they all part of this global sort of parallel civilization that the ancestors keep talking about? And the answer was, after many years of work and talking to uh, people from a local point of view, because let's face it, they know about the stories better than any white uh, European academic. Their predecessors lived through these things. So I wanted to hear it from their point of view. And after you've learned a few dead languages, you begin to realize that the names of people are not names, they're titles, and they mean something. And once you start realizing that they're all interconnected, it helps you put together this extraordinary story of about 400 pages of how all of these gods were part of an interconnected brother and sisterhood. And they lived in various locations around the world, most of which are now underwater. And they too fell prey to uh, big waves and their you know, lands went under the ocean, at which point they are forced to hang out with us lucky humans at specific points around the world where just by coincidence, humans discovered at this very same moment civilization and we accredit the uh, the gods coming out of nowhere out of the ocean giving us the accoutrements of uh, knowledge 
animal husbandry, uh, crop rotation, and so forth, uh, mathematics, and building big buildings with big rocks. And it all happened in little spurts all around the world. So that's what the book really was about, finding out where these people lived and also who they were. Oh, so what, So there's different theories about the Younger Dryas and all that. But, so your theory is an impact in the ocean would cause like an, a tidal wave that or a tsunami that big to be able to, you know, cover many par parts of the world in a wave. And that's what <laughs> e ended civilization at that time, more or less. Pretty much so. I mean, the uh, the beginning of the Younger Dryas, we had the uh, most of the points of impact, and it was the same problem. And it was the same uh, uh, time of the year, by the way, uh, beginning of November, and there's the first clue of what's responsible. And uh, they talk about these burning rocks coming out of the sky. The earth was actually tilted on its axis, and they described it as a period of in uh, indescribable cold. And uh, they had about 900 years to get their act together in terms of finding out this, where they can live, because you know, the sea levels are rising, uh, lands are disappearing, and they figured we need some place where we can grow crops. And that's where we find most of the ancient cultures living in between the true tropics, which at the time was the best part in the world to live. So you have the first uh, group of gods arrive in the Nile Valley uh, called the Followers of Horus. And incidentally, uh, 300 years with, into the Younger Dryas, there is a sudden uh, uncontested uh, agricultural revolution along the Nile. And uh, this is actually in the Egyptian record. So there's a backup story for this. We can actually validate it. And then um, the, um, the end of the Younger Dryas, same thing happened. Again, beginning of November, big rocks coming out of the sky. And this time they hit mostly water, which is what accounts for so many of the accounts of uh, waves coming out of the middle of nowhere. Uh, even Aboriginal people who are in the middle of the outback, uh, they actually saw, I've got the accounts of different tribes looking at the ocean from different parts of Australia, watching waves coming at them from all sides. Uh, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, and especially in the Pacific Islands, which of course took the brunt of this. And it's funny that uh, the first Europeans that were going to the Pacific in the 16th century, there's an account by a Portuguese sailor collecting the stories and they're saying, well, these are lovely islands that you have. And these, the islanders said, no, these aren't islands. These are the tops of the mountains of the lands where we used to live. And they didn't say a land, they said many lands. Mm -hmm. So the whole of the Pacific was essentially a whole a hodgepodge of uh, big land masses, which all disappeared. And it was, uh, some of them were on US naval charts as long as 1945. Uh, I remember the Navy actually going out to the Pacific looking for one which is on the map, which actually stretched over the horizon, somewhere between Chile and Easter Island. And the Navy uh, spent 46 days looking for this big island. They couldn't find anything. Uh, so this is not a figment of the imagination. This actually happened. So as you said, there are multiple points of impact. Are these... Uh I know we have at least evidence of there There may be a crater that uh, lies under the ice in Greenland that might have been, they, some scientists are attributing that might have been one of the, uh, the cat, you know, the cat cataclysmic events, uh, impacts that affected the Younger Dryas. And you're saying there's another one, at least a little, one other one that seems to be like Peru, like off the coast of South America, that probably would have been one as well. Is there more or is there just those two? Oh, uh, many, many more. Uh, the one in Greenland belongs to the beginning of the Younger Dryas, along with hundreds and hundreds of holes, uh, which you'll find along North Carolina all the way down to um, uh, Georgia. Uh, they call the Carolina Bays, and it shows uh, hundreds and hundreds of small meteors hitting the Earth coming in from the Northwest. You can still see the way that the shape of the hole and the, and the, and the tail behind it, they're all following a specific, specific pattern. The other ones are very much harder to find because they're covered with sediment and they're mostly in coastal areas or in the water itself. And as we begin to develop the technology and uh, underwater lidar, for example, we begin to find that there are depressions all over the earth which uh, seem to have been caused pretty much around the same time and also following the same trajectory. And uh, the culprit here is the torrid meteor shower, right. which happens every November, uh, which I was surprised to find when I was in Peru they were celebrating this in November. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the problem with uh, celebrating the Day of the Dead in Peru in November is that they should be celebrating it in May because the calendar is upside down in the Southern Hemisphere. And in the Pacific, in islands where they should be celebrating it in May, they're also celebrating in November. So I pursued the matter a little bit further 
and found out they said, well, actually, we have two days of the dead. We do have one in May, but we also have one in November. And it's to celebrate not the dead so much, but the survivors of the Great Flood. So now we have people from Peru all the way to Indonesia and Southeast Asia celebrating an event which was caused, like I said, by observations of burning mountains coming out of the sky, uh, forming the, the meteor shower called the Torrids. And uh, the last time we had this problem was in uh, the Tungusta blast in Siberia. Uh, I think it was 1902, somewhere around there. And uh, that came in June because, of course, it's not just one way stream, it's a, a torrid shape. Um, so, the, you know, it's like a big elliptical orbit that this shower of debris, uh, the Earth has to go through twice a year, not just once. But the fun part is, in November, we can actually see it because it's facing the sun. But when we return to that um, toroid uh, belt, the uh, objects are coming from the side of the sun, which means we don't see them at all. And uh, mm. every time there's been any near major catastrophe on this planet since the Younger Dryas, so there has been at least 13 known events, um, the problems always appear at the beginning of November. So be careful what you're celebrating on November the 1st. <laughs> um, you are actually commemorating uh, not only the people who, who died, and it was mostly everybody, uh, except for a handful of gods and humans, uh, but also the survivors, because otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. No kidding. So the, a fragmented comment from the stream is responsible for impacts pretty much all over the globe. And that was, that's the cataclysm. Pretty much. And uh, it's been worked out that uh, the trail of debris that circles the sky is essentially the fragments of a very ancient mini planet or a very, very large comet. Um, and I, don't, I think they give it different names. I can't remember all of them right now, but it's not important. Uh, the fact is that uh, the latest mathematical and astronomical projections show that um, we're pretty close to understanding how the matter in the debris field works. There are big bits and small bits, and we've been pretty lucky over the last um, 8,000 years. We've been getting little bits. The problem is between 2032 and 2042, uh, is that the big bits are coming our way. And NASA is very, very concerned uh, that we are looking at a very close near-death scenario here on Earth, which is explains why every week they're releasing yet another public relations uh, exercise telling us, hey, we just found more objects which are have a near-Earth trajectory. And we're looking into more ways to make sure that if we find any bigger ones, we are somehow ready uh, to blow them out of the sky. And it's every single week there's another uh, story that comes out from them. And they are very concerned that we are facing uh, some serious issues here. Uh, the interesting thing is that the end of the Maya uh, window of, of opportunity, everybody thinks that 2012 was the end of the world, and any Maya will just laugh at this. And they'll say, no, uh, 2012 was a medium point in the calendar. There's a 30-year window either side to get our act together, we have to achieve a critical mass to raise consciousness here on the Earth. And by the way, we're not that far from it, by the way, but that's another story. But as the window of opportunity closes, so the catastrophes and the points of destruction get more perverse and they get closer to us as well. And so it's kind of funny that the mathematical projections end exactly on the year that the Maya have at the close of the cycle. And the other thing that I thought was interesting was a piece of information that I've been sitting on for over 25 years, uh, which we thought was unusual at the time. It goes back to a, a specific and genuine crop circle, because there are lots of things made by people as well. But this is back in the day when real crop circles were around. Back in 1995, there was an incredible uh, shape that was, uh, appeared in Hampshire, beautiful depiction of the inner solar system with all the asteroid belt all around it, mathematically correct, except the Earth is missing from its orbit. And of course, we try to figure out why. Uh, we want to keep it positive as well. And we had the um, uh, astronomer general of Boston University looking into this. And um, he calculated that actually when you look at the position of the shapes of the planets in the crop circle, you can actually figure out dates. And the first one was in 1902 when the Wright brothers uh, took off from a beach in North Carolina in November. And the next time, he says, if you count the little holes around the crop circle, which would simulate the asteroid belt, it gives you X number of years. So I calculated that and figured, actually, that gives you the next time in 1972 when the next configuration appears again in the sky. And that was when the Mars uh, probe was being sent to the red planet. 
So, and we figured, well, why are the crop circle makers giving us these important dates in aviation, which are wonderful, but they're not exactly earth shaking. So the third, and he said, the third time we'll see this configuration in the sky would be 2038, which is right within that lovely frame of when NASA's saying uh, uh, that stands a pretty high chance of being obliterated by sky objects, and we need to get our um, A together in order to find a way, a solution around this. So I, I, I find this very interesting because we're getting the information from different perspectives, from astronomers, mathematicians, psychics, crop circles, and then prophecy as well. So a lot of things overlapping here. And I should point out that when I was finishing the chapter to the missing lands, I didn't want to end it on a, on a sour note. And there is an antidote and there is a potentially happy ending to this. And I'm not going to tell you here right now. <laughs> 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 you got to tune in to find out. So we have this torrid meteor shower that the Earth goes through twice a year. November seems to be the bad time because you can't see them coming. So what is that? 12,000 years ago, are you, you're saying that there's like advanced civilizations that seem to be wiped out from this and they, they relocate and then restart civilization in Nile Valley and other places around the world? Yeah, if you look at the uh, surviving traditions, they're pretty clear about this. And one of them was the Edfu building texts, which a, um, a woman called uh, Eve Raymond, who passed away a few years ago, she deciphered the entire walls. And it's very, very great reading. It also costs you $600 for the book, by the way, <laughs> uh, unless you uh, apply me with a lot of beer and then I'll give you uh, a copy. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not partying <laughs> with my copy. But it's very, it's very explicit that they describe, and the Greeks found this in pieces, by the way, so it's not the whole story, but it's uh, what, what is left is very clear that after the first, the beginning of the Younger Dryas, the gods began to move to places where they could uh, find habitation and grow crops because it was getting colder. And the Nile Valley was exceptional at that moment. It was very wet, uh, very uh, perfect conditions for growing good crops. And back then, the Nile was also flooded with the Indian Ocean. You could actually sail there quite directly. There was a very different geology. And the gods came from the, uh, the island of fire, uh, Iutiti, uh, uh, which is actually a misnomer for Lake Titicaca as well. But that's another story. And um, they, they knew their land was sinking, and they could prognosticate the position of the stars in the sky. And they knew that they had X number of years before they could, get, they could and I quote, rebuild the former mansions of the gods along the Nile Valley upon which would stand the future historic temples. That's mm -hmm. a direct quote from the actual wall. So they knew that their time was finite. They had to start civilization going. They knew they had to go back where they came from to kind of, you know, take it on the chin. And then they would, the survivors would agree to return to these specific hotspots around the world and rebuild what they had started. And the next time you see that story is at Lake Titicaca with Tiwanaku. Mm -hmm. The uh, medium age of one of its temples is 15,000 BC, according to the alignments between the stones and the horizon. But there's an earlier section there, which dates back to about 36,000 BC, which is very consistent with the beginning of the reign of pharaohs in Egypt, according to the Turin Papyrus. Archaeologists don't want to talk about that because it's very inconvenient, but there it is. The dates are right there. So the people in the Andes said, no, these people were here. They built a great civilization that was parallel to us. They didn't really want to hang out with humans. Uh, they kind of felt that they didn't want to influence us. But whenever they needed to, and it was absolutely necessary, they would give us information. They were very helpful. And then they go back to where they were living. But there was this point where they, uh, even their lands went under during the, uh, the flood and also the sea levels rose, you know, 400 feet in most places. Mm -hmm. So they were up against the wall. They ran out of land and they were forced to go to move to places like the uh, Nile Valley and uh, Lake Titicaca, where they already had established places before, and uh, restart civilization, according to their words. And you'll find the same story in the Yucatan. You'll find the same story in Portugal. You'll find the same story also in the lands of Mesopotamia and also throughout the Pacific, which is extraordinary. Well, now even, we, you know, ahead, even when we're kind of looking at uh, one of the things that struck me with Gobeki Tepe is that it's so high above sea level and it, you know, it's it, it, maybe that's one of these things where this is one of these civilizations that's moved because they got obliterated because, you know, they were perhaps by the sea when this all went down, and they were like, "Hey, well, if we're going to build anything, it's got to be somewhere where this can't happen again. Like we got to preserve this and preserve some knowledge." 
It's a very good observation. And in fact, I, I wrote about that in my second book, The Divine Blueprint, before they even came up with the carbon dating for Gobekli Tepe. And I stuck my neck out on this. I said, you know, the way it, it, it looks to me is as though someone very carefully put the earth over the monoliths. They carefully built a little wall. They didn't want to damage anything, as though they're expecting to come back and dig it up and continue as before. Right. And that's, staying, that's sticking your neck out because you can't prove it, but that's how it, the site appeared to me. And it turns out it was absolutely correct. It was very carefully concealed without damaging anything. And the carbon dates, which followed the, uh, the publication of the book, were absolutely right too. The medium date is 9,900 BC, which is just before the event. Uh, which is dated geologically at 9,700 BC, uh, Tuesday. And you've got to laugh at this. Uh, but there's an early one. The, 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 the carbon dating comes from the wall itself, from the organic matter in the wall. The problem is that wall is obscuring uh, important detail. Therefore, the site had to be built before the site was built because that's when the protective wall was built. So it turns out there is an earlier date of 10,200 BC. So that puts us very firmly in the middle of the Younger Dryas. And it's part of a, uh, an area which I'm very um, interested in at the moment. It's to do with the Armenian uh, highlands. And I'm writing about it right now because when we talk about the um, Anunnaki, who always get very bad press, and it really annoys me because these people actually help us out of a huge hole. It's only the uh, a small group of them that get all the bad press, and they did behave very badly. But we forget about the other people. And I've, I'm so far trying to locate... Um, an area where they used to live, and it's not far from Gobekli Tepe. It's another 400 miles uh, to the north, right in the Armenian Highlands, near Lake Van. And there is a remnant of a very, what used to be a very large island, which is volcanic, uh, around a massive lake, which has uh, since uh, expanded with lava flows. It's now connected to the mainland. But they, for me, the descriptions in the books of Enoch, in the original version, they do talk about the island where they live being volcanic, very large, with a large civilization surrounded by water. And if we're talking about the Armenian highlands as being the origin of one of these places where the gods lived, that fits the bill quite well because I've just located a big uh, sort of island-shaped area in that part of the world, which turns out for many thousands of years was a major spiritual center. And it does show signs of had there having been a megalithic civilization there. The problem is there's no money to dig up the place. It's highly political. You've got the problem with, uh, with Turkey uh, next door who does not like the Armenians. And uh, they should be ashamed uh, about this. Uh, and also, there's not much digging going around. So it's, it's a kind of a wait and see what happens. This is right on the cusp of new research. But I do believe they're absolutely right, because the stories that I've uncovered from the Armenian archaeologists, uh, most of it is not written in English. I've got someone working with me with the translations right now. They are tying very much with what was happening with other megalithic sites like Gobekli Tepe all around the world. And the common thing is language. And the fact that they were great navigators and, of course, fantastic astronomers. Uh, these things appear in, gr in groups all over the place. And the big connection, uh, and this is something that I published in The Missing Lands, was the original name of Gobekli Tepe, because that's a Turkish name. We don't call it that. Uh, the Park Belly Hill? <laughs> 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 Absolutely. After five scotches, you can speak in any language. Um, no, it's uh, the original name is Portasar, which in Armenian means... Uh, the umbilical cord of Osiris. Now, what is Osiris doing 800 mm. miles away from Giza, I wonder? Well, the next place where you'll find the uh, uh, place of Osiris is Giza. And one of those moments where suddenly the god just dropped this image into my head and I go, no, I wonder if that could actually be true. And I was kind of, it's almost like I was shown this image of Gobekli Tepe or Porta Sar and Giza. And there's a big line connecting the two. And I thought, wait a minute. Let me go and check my archaeological details. And sure enough, if you plot a line, if you take a cord between the corner of the, the pyramid of Menkaure to the corner of the pyramid of Kafre, and you keep going, you end up at Portasar. So mm. there's your umbilical cord. There are two sites which are connected by the same gods, although they call them by different names. So in the Armenian highlands, they are the um, Anunnaki, or the lords of Anu. And in Egypt, they are the Aku Shem Suhar, which means... Followers of Horus, Shining Ones. And, of course, the nickname for the Anunnaki was the Shining Ones. So um, you see how these things are now connecting very, very nicely. K 
Okay, I, I want to ask now. So we've talked about now the shiny ones, the Anunnaki. You said they're not human, but they're also, they're, they're not ET, right? They're from here. They, the word that, or the phrase that I kept hearing again and again during research was uh, human-like, but not quite human. And humans were very comfortable with them. Uh, they were just like us. Uh, and the description that I get, for, whether it's in Armenia or in Egypt or in the Indian Ocean or in Pacific Islands you've never even heard of, which is incredible. They, they actually talk about the Anunnaki in the Cook Islands. You have to look oh. that up on Google Earth. Uh, they call it, they describe as being about eight and a half feet tall. So they're very, very tall, not giants, but very, very tall. Light skinned, not white skinned, but light skinned, red head with green eyes and blonde with blue eyes. And that because they had a problem with the sun, they had to keep smearing some oil like suntan lotion on their skin. So they also came from a, a different a latitude. And uh, this is the reason why they were called the shining people, because it did look like they were shining, according to local Listening. Uh, human beings. <laughs> yeah. Covered in baby oil. oil. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we can look like the gods and get smeared. Um, but the, the thing is, it also described as a metaphor their level of intellect. When you have a lot of wisdom and knowledge, you are shining. You have a sort of a glow about you. So it was a double metaphor. And like I said, the description appears all around the world. Well, so there, I guess they would be like a like a co-evolved hominid species that maybe started earlier, became way more advanced, and then the cataclysm, I guess, would... If they are, I mean, if you're light skinned, that means you're, you're from the Northern, like closer, like farther North, right? You need less sun in the winter. And that would be the assumption. So they must've been here a long time before. And if you look at the stories of the Hopi as well, and put them into the equation, they also talk about these people, uh, as the ant people, uh, because they were very, uh, laborious and they said they came from somewhere else and much further to the North and also to the, to the West. And, uh, the reason why they call them the ant people was because they came from a place originally, this is where the, the, the kind of alien human thing gets into a little bit of a gray area, which is great fun, uh, because they're saying originally the place of where they came from uh, was Orion, and they're associated with Orion's belt, the three stars, and that's why the, the ant symbolism stuck, because when you look at red ants, not only are they very laborious and they're industrious, and they, they said it, it described the, what the gods did, they were very industrial people, they were wonderful, they, did, they created order out of chaos, uh, but they also, because the three parts of the uh, ant body, it, the three parts of the, the ant represent the three stars and the belt of Orion. And this is consistent in every ancient culture around the world, which, of course, got me to ask the, the question on your mind. Did they really come from Orion? Well, we don't know. But what the ancient people said was, was that uh, there was a one point many thousands of years ago when the conditions were right, when these people were able to go from here to Orion as easily as you and, go, you and I go shopping for a can of baked beans, whether it was using craft or whether it was using special buildings like the Great Pyramid, uh, because there's no one buried there, by the way, or whether there was another means to escape the physical body and travel astrally to be there and project yourself in a physical realm. All of these things appear in every mythology around the world. So for that to happen, there had to be an eyewitness account. They couldn't, they couldn't have just made this up because if we're hunter-gatherers, surely we're not intelligent enough to make that leap of imagination. The two things just don't go together. So I'm likely to believe that this has been correct because there are many cases where they said once in a while the gods would take a lucky human with them to the bell stars of Orion to show them their world, to see how things can be done. You don't have to kill people. You don't have to drag your wives by the hair into a cave and beat the crap out of them. Um, sorry, I probably shouldn't say that on radio. Uh, you can actually behave to, uh, you know, in a very orderly uh, way to respect each other and grow and do civilization the way we have done it. And, and then suddenly, boom, back you go to the earth. And this hunter-gatherer will go back to his people and say, guess what I've been this weekend? Right. And guess what I have seen? And that's what elevated hunter-gatherers. And they said, you know, we can do better than this. And slowly you get these pockets of uh, culture appearing throughout the world. So I find the stories very persuasive because we have to remember that myth is not just a figment of the imagination. It's a theatrical device that enables a story to be remembered for millennia. Because if you, if I was going to tell you a story about me going down to the shops to buy groceries and driving a car, you, you know, you find it kind of amusing. But years from now, you wouldn't remember it. But if you dress it up as Jason and the Argonauts, 
or Osiris and Isis, and later on, Afra and the Grail, by the way, they're variations on the theme. Uh, you remember the stories, but you know, academia wants you to believe that they're all myth and they're make-believe. No, they were theatrical devices to get to make sure that you would never forget the story. And of course we don't. Right. Now, so now these, uh, the, the, the shiny ones now, are they all part in, in, um, in your theories, uh, you know, your research, are they all part of a singular civilization or is it like, like they were on one Island or is it like every, not every, but perhaps like a number of the mythical lost lands, you know, your Atlantises, your Lemurias, your Moos, your high Brazils, your Hyperboreas, like, are they all, do they all have a, a similar validity in your in your theory, or is it they're just like one in a few lost lands that are like, these are the ones that they're from, or this is the most likely? Uh, no, they're actually the same people, uh, or should I, I should say the same group, the same academy, because they couldn't get around that quickly and be at the, at the same place twice, unless they were really extraordinary, and I wouldn't put it past them. Um, no, uh, from uh, my uh, understanding of, uh, like I said, dead languages, uh, these the names that they have weren't names, they were titles. So, for example, Vida Kosha and the Hai Hai Wapanti. Well, you ask the Ayamara and the Bukina, well, what does that mean? Does it mean anything? They'll say, yes, it means the shining people. Well, now you just link the shining ones in Mesopotamia to South America. Right. And the fact is, they always appeared in groups of seven with one woman who was the wisdom keeper, and she was married to the eighth guy who was this charismatic leader. Always that symbolism, always one guy with seven people who were sages. And it appears in Central America, it appears in uh, in Portugal, in the Middle East, and so forth. And uh, from the stories that I collected, there was, for example, uh, one story in South America that talked about Viracocha going between South America, or Lake Titicaca, to East Island, bouncing off the birthplace of the gods in New Zealand. And by the way, it's still there. I've been there six times. It's an extraordinary place. Um, I think they're going to give me the keys to the country now that I've written about it. <laughs> uh, and then on the way back, they went one? past Easter Island because of the way the currents work, and they went to a place called Kainga Nui Nui, and they said it no longer exists because it went under the waves after the Great Flood. And from there, they would continue back to South America to Lake Titicaca. Uh, so that's another one there. There's another one called Kashkara, which is to the north of that, which is what the Hopi called one of the lands that uh, submerged uh, at the end of the Younger Dryas. And of course, Atl in the middle of the Atlantic, which becomes the Atlantis of the uh, Greek era. And by the way, I should point out that uh, the person that went to Egypt to look at this story, there was an Egyptian priest that told a Greek guy called Solon. He said, you know what? You Greeks are so young. You don't know anything yet. You haven't lived. You know, wait till you've been around as long as we have in Egypt, 36,000 years. Uh, and this was over two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, you know, and uh, we, let's, uh, let me tell you about the story of the time when the island of the gods uh, submerged. One of them was in the Indian Ocean, the island of fire, and the other one was somewhere else uh, on the other side of the world in the big ocean. And uh, this guy called Solon takes the story back to Greece and he gets picked up by a guy called Plato. Now, Plato has a definite time that uh, Solon was given of about 9,600 BC, which is only 100 years away from the geological record of the flood. Now, if you go to the Maya lands in the Yucatan, they wrote this down too, and they have exactly the same story, where there's a group of gods that survived from this land called Atl in the middle of the Atlantic, and they were called the Its. Uh, they were into really big names back then. Uh, the Its arrived in the Yucatan Peninsula as survivors after the sea level was rising, and they arrived there in 9,600 BC. So now you have the same timestamp in the Yucatan as you do in Egypt with the same people. And the thing that connects these two people together is that their other nickname was the people of the serpent. And not because they were reptilians, but the, uh, when you're associated with the serpent symbolism, it means that you are in total control of the laws of nature, which behave like a serpent flowing along the ground. They're unseen, they're the, they're the currents, the telluric lines, if you like. Uh, so if you have control of the laws of nature, which they all did, apparently, you are defined as a person of the serpent. And they said that these people arrived in Yucatan in a raft of serpents. Now, nobody's mad enough to get in a boat full of snakes. Uh, the title actually described the people that were in there. 
Well, that story appears in Portugal as well, because they split up into two, and they were called the Offuser, which means the people of the serpent. And you have that story appearing in India with a group of people, people of the serpent, called the Anunnaga, which is the same as the Anunnaki. So you see how these things begin to overlap quite nicely around the world. Right. So a global spanning population of, let's, well, the, let's call them the shining ones. Exactly. Dis quite tall. <laughs> quite tall. Displaced by the cataclysm. Now, forgive me. So if, are the shining ones the ones who would have built in your in your research, like Puma Punka and these like amazing megalithic structures, or did they just supply like the building pro building techniques to like humans to build those? There was a group of people who were the measurers of the sky and uh, within that group, and it was usually related to this group of seven, they were all masters of their own craft. One of them knew the understanding of sound and sonics and what sonics can do to physical objects and also to consciousness, which we can now prove to be absolutely correct. I mean, if you use sound at a low frequency with a low amplitude, you can destroy this computer in about five seconds. Uh, you can also heal me uh, by the same process by reversing the uh, the frequency. Uh, and um, they also had people who understood the characteristics of stone. So they basically worked together as a group. And the, in the Egyptian texts are very clear at what they did. First of all, they would set out the landscape where they wanted to build something of note. They would calculate the position of the stars because you had to have the sky ground dualism. You had to mirror a certain uh, time and frame to memorialize that time on the ground with the direction of the temple. And first they would clear the enemy snake, which is any dead enemy that was on the ground. And then they would uh, potentize a water like a moat around this pregnant belly. And then they would take this sacred measure, which was derived from the two building blocks of nature, the, uh, the sphere and the tetrahedron. How the hell did they figure this out? We don't right. know. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And it's a specific unit of measure as well. It's bloody accurate. Uh, we only discovered this with the electron microscope. And then come the geometry, specific geometries influence a certain state of mind within the buildings. And then the builders would anchor the energy, making sure it wouldn't move anywhere. And we know today that there's a lot of crystal, a uh, certain type of quartz and magnetite used in the rocks, used for the megaliths. Uh, this is why you know people didn't pick that rock. They picked the rock that was 400 miles away, conveniently, because there's something about the properties that could be programmed within the quartz which we know is a pH of electric substance, so you can tell quartz what to do. So the rock was very specific, and then they would anchor the energy to the site, and that's what made it sacred. Uh, the laws of physics were slowly moved in a way that created this kind of thin tissue between worlds. So you could be here and there at the same time if you knew how to work this wonderful spiritual magic. So they worked together as a group, uh, because again, uh, all the cultures said, these gods had complete control of the laws of nature. They knew how to manipulate it. They, they could be in two places at once. They could foresee the future. Uh, they could heal. They could move the rocks using sound and the sound of their voices. So they had complete control of everything. And again, they, uh, the uh, you know, our hunter-gatherer predecessors were in complete awe of them, and they were not afraid of them. They worked with them all the time. That's amazing. So like a, a lost technology is what you're saying. Exactly. And uh, I mean, it survives to the, in, in certain respects because uh, uh, one of the things I enjoy doing is looking at the uh, documents that the missionaries, uh, the Christian ministries uh, wrote when they were trying to uh, basically, uh, well, subvert the whole of Polynesia. And uh, before they killed everybody, either by plague or by Christianity, they would write down everything. They were very nosy in that respect. And uh, if you're lucky, you'll come across their notebooks. And I was amazed to find that when the white people showed up in Polynesia, the uh, indigenous people were incredulous that this supposedly advanced culture from Europe did not believe that you could move objects through the air. This is, and they said this matter of fact, they'll sat, they'll sat there saying, what do you mean you don't know how that 400 ton piece of rock was moved? It moved through the air, don't you know this? Uh, and I would love to have been a fly on the wall watching the native people sort of doing this, you know, it's like, oh dear. And they said, you know, even the priests could move through the air as well. They were incredible masters of just, you know, anti-gravity. They could uh, move things at will using their, the power of their mind. And you hear this in the Cook Islands, the Solomon Islands, uh, Tahiti, uh, Tonga, and also an Easter Island. So it's a story that carries itself through time. I have 
one more question I want to ask before we let you go. So the shining ones, uh, you know, 12,000 years ago, they instill into humanity, uh, maybe agriculture and all the other technologies we have carried forward. What, uh, what in, in your research, what, what's your theory on what happened to them and why we don't have communication with them or like this to, to, like to this day? Oh, we do. <laughs> there we go. That's what I was uh, hoping for. Well, they most of them died. Uh, they knew that they were up against uh, some you know, huge challenges. And even with all their power, they couldn't move all these enormous rocks coming out of the sky and obliterating pretty much everything. But they had planned ahead. They knew that there would be survivors and they'd move strategically. And there's one story in the Egyptian text that says that uh, the gods that were fortunate enough to be in the ocean survived. Because, of course, all they got was very, very large waves. And uh, one story that I found in New Zealand, of all places, talks about a time when the gods were in the ocean, in the Pacific, and one of their catamarans was overturned by these huge waves. And luckily, they were nowhere near the continental shelf, otherwise they wouldn't have survived. And they picked up the survivors, they moved to the birthplace of the gods. Um, the, um, the survivors knew that they were up against a big challenge called genetics. They could not marry normal women because they were eight and a half foot tall. Human women, by and large, are about five and a half feet tall. They gave birth to infants and they killed the mothers. And the story still appears in the Wichita of Oklahoma this very, very day. So again, important to hear the stories of our predecessors. They recorded everything. But there was one time when they actually succeeded. And this is where we get the stories of the genetic experimentations with humans. And you get some things which didn't go work out too well. But in other areas, they actually worked out fine because for one thing, they created the uh, the uh, Egyptian pharaonic line, which they described after the flood as being half human, half divine. So they did succeed. And they said that uh, we would put one of our own shining people on the throne until we could find some human that was, you know, sensible enough to govern. And uh, they were righteous and we leave the humans to their own devices. But we keep we keep an eye on them because, you know, once in a while, the ego and the power would get to these people. We'd have to remove them. We'd have to take the throne. We'd have to marry another human woman, get some children and put them on the throne because we needed someone to set the example for everybody else. So they were doing us a huge favor just to keep us saving us from being, um, you know, barbarians. And um, eventually the bloodline just dies out at, at death. So we get to Amenhotep the third, Akhenaten, and of course Tutankhamun were part of that bloodline. And you can tell because of the shape of the skull, right. uh, the elongated heads were part of that culture and they were also red headed, uh, which is very unusual in that part of the world. So after that, they kind of intermingled and they got that the bloodline got much more diffused. We talk about the Sumerian bloodline going into Europe with the Merovingian bloodline of the royal courts of Europe. Uh, that all went very much astray once the Catholic Church entered the picture, but we're now thousands of years ahead. Um, I actually asked this, uh, this again to some people in the indigenous world and the Hopi were very useful and also the Zuni and they said, you know what, once in a while they'll still show up here in their uh, sky ships or their flying, uh, what are they called, the, uh, the flying discs mm. um, and uh, or the flying shields, there you go. And uh, Clifford Mahuti, who I love hearing uh, all the time, he says, yeah, I mean, we still go out on the uh, canyons and once in a while when we're at the right place at the right time, and usually there's a shamanic connection that tells us that something is gonna happen, they'll be here. And, uh, and I said, oh, have you ever taken anyone to uh, witness it? I said, oh yeah, there's always a big guy with driving an F-150 truck, wants to come out and hang out with the aliens. And I said, yeah, I can do that. So we went out there, sat on the canyon about 11.30 at night. One of the sky ships comes by, uh, you know, visible, you know, literally within a few hundred yards of you. And, and I said, so what happened? You've never seen a big guy run for his truck <laughs> and come back and he doesn't want to talk about it. I said, so when are you coming over to visit? I said, I'll be there next week. I'll, I'm, I'll be happy to see these people. Um, so they do still appear to people who they feel the connection with, they feel welcomed here on Earth. We're not going to shoot them. So if they feel that there's a welcome mat here, they will come and connect with you. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, a lot of them who, who are now in the spirit world, they're obviously dead, but this, that, that, this because you're dead doesn't mean you can't be useful. They still communicate with us from their level of reality because we don't really die. The soul moves on. And I am friends with a very, very good psychic in Britain who helps the police with their inquiries. 
and she has a near 100% record of looking for dead people, missing people, and so forth. And the information we get from her is 100% excellent all the time. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I asked when we're in session, because uh, she's a chance channel, I said, um, so what's going on? I mean, uh, I know that the bloodline became very diffused. There's people still part of the bloodline today, but they probably don't even know who they are now. Uh, so what happened? I said, well, you know, we stopped coming. Uh, you can trace our history in your earth history and you'll see wherever you find shining ones or people who are physically different. That's us. We come over there. We become the teachers of civilization. We're, you know, uh, our great architects, visionaries. And then we die like you. We go away. Just, just to give you a little hint of what's possible in the human race. You don't have to kill each other. But if we got tired of being crucified. That was their actual words. We got tired of being crucified. It hurts. So now we just communicate from more subtle means. We'll give scientists an idea of new propulsion. Or recently, you may have noticed, we began to make signs of geometric shapes in your fields, which of course, they're the ones behind the real crop circles as well. And the people that we communicated with at the beginning of the crop circle phenomenon back in the late 70s call themselves the shining ones. That's, a, that's awesome. So in conclusion, like what people see as or experience as ETs or aliens in your, in your research, in your theory, they're still here either. So like, are they coming here from somewhere else? Or are they, because you, sometimes you hear, you know, UFOs that come out of the water. Is it possible that they live still underground or underwater or? What, what do you think? Oh, yeah, there's one place in Peru, not far from Cusco, where the local people do not want to go near this lake. Uh, it's a little bit, they're, they're fearful and yet they're reverential towards it. They know who's there. And they said, yeah, I mean, there's craft going into the lake and they're coming out of the lake and it's not man-made stuff. Uh, and they'll, you know, they'll leave offerings and, they'll, and they respect, but they do give it a little bit of a, a wide berth. So I'm likely to believe that these things are still going on. I think we live in a much more complicated universe. And the one thing that I always hear back, whether it's indigenous people or it's psychic people communicating with these entities or physical people, is that one thing is very clear. They're all concerned as to what we choose to do here on Earth because the implications have repercussions throughout eternity. And they need to move on with their reality too because what we do will affect the outcome of their reality. So they have a vested interest in what we're doing and they are assisting on the sides. They're not going to do things for us. That will be easy. Right. Uh, they're assisting on the side, suggesting new methods of propulsion, uh, new ways of doing things and putting the idea into people's heads. And then we go, hey, I had a great idea to build this anti-gravity device. Aren't I clever? Well, the idea is coming from somewhere else because then we have to be part of that. And I can say that there are three groups of scientists who have developed anti-gravity in England, in America and in Australia. And they're saying we're just waiting for the right politically expedient moment because you know what we don't want to die either you know you hear about these people who develop hydrogen power cars and they get run over by their own vehicles incredible how that happens um so they're waiting for the right opportune moment to tell the world and guess where what they use as the blueprint for the design the um design of the crop circle on the cover of my first book and i put that there for a good reason oh cool so it's, uh, it's, so it's very it's, hopeful we live in uh, hope it's it's funny you say that because like I I know an architect uh, he he's a very eccentric guy and he says that he's given visions of some sort of device yeah. and he has drawings of it partial drawings all scattered and he's shown me some of them and he goes I he's like I'm just waiting to get the final portions these are all unfinished but I haven't been given the final portions yet. I don't quite understand it, but I'm sure once I get the final and I was like, how long have you been getting these vis like visions? He's like a decade, maybe decade, 12 years. I've just, I just all of a sudden get an impulse to start designing this thing. And yeah. then I instantly know it fits with my last drawings. So yeah. it's kind of interesting to hear that. Oh, I totally, I totally believe it. Uh, there's a lot more going on. It's, and it's very helpful that we are being looked after and we're, 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 there's a lot of assistance going on on the side. I, I, I do believe that Tesla was one of them as well because so many of his blueprints match the early crop circles back in the days before hoaxing was even, uh, even came into the equation. So I do think he was also tapping into something else. Dan, any final questions? No, those are good. I think... Uh, uh... Yeah, it's always He's fun having Freddie, I, Freddy, I, got, I got one more question. Have you ever uh, looked into uh, the Coral Castle in Florida? 
He was another one as well. Uh, he left you a clue. Uh, it's all about my sweet 16. So, of course, our mind goes straight to underage liaisons. Uh, no, that's not what it was about. Uh, it was to do with the fact that it's a math. He was a mathematician, and he was always to, uh, uh, talking about gravity. It's like we understand so little about gravity, and the uh, the answer to the ancients and what they were able to do lies in anti gravity and our lack of understanding of it. But I've been able to demonstrate it here, and I left the equation. And I believe the last time I touched on the subject, there was a young mathematician who actually looked at this and he said, well, wait a minute, the, the 16 actually does mean something mathematically, and let me explain it to you. Uh, now, I can't because I'm not a mathematician, but I believe he wrote a small pamphlet which they're still selling at the Coral Castle, and he said he appears to have cracked the code, and it's to do with also with the use of sound, because one thing was very apparent in the Coral Castle, Leedskillen was using a lot of copper wire and a lot of sound generating equipment. Now, why would you need that to cut coral and to move large blocks of coral, which is a bloody hard rock to work with, out of the ground and shape it overnight to make this castle. And the uh, people also who almost witnessed him doing this, they remembered hearing high-pitched sounds. Uh, and then next thing you know, he's got another section of the wall finished without uh, having the assistance of human labor. So the fact that all this stuff was confiscated by the CIA should tell you that it's to do with sound, it's to do with anti-gravity, and all of these things go back to what the ancestors were saying. These people had complete uh, control of the laws of nature. They knew how to work with nature, and there's nothing more and, central than the understanding of gravity. And going to your point earlier uh, about the healing factor, you know, he it is t said that he had terminal tuberculosis. Uh, he was given a diagnosis of that that had spontaneously healed uh, that he attributed to his work. Exactly. That, uh, helped heal him. So, oh, if you want to take that further, for, uh, look at what the, the uh, Sound Healers Association Atlanta is up to. A very interesting group of people. And by the way, they're not allowed to mention the word healing uh, because of the FDA. And I helped them design their uh, uh, PR material back when I was a designer. And it was a nightmare to talk in metaphors to people to get them to understand that what they're doing with sound frequency can heal anything, including cancer, but we're not allowed to mention any of that. But they are an interesting group of people doing incredible things under extraordinary circumstances. That's awesome. Hey, Freddie, we appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to we're going to we're going to let you go. For Amazing. those of you looking to get into Freddie's work, you can check out his website, invisibletemple.com. He's got all the links there. All great, Freddie. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, dude, for some reason, like every time we're talking to these people, I always feel like I'm getting a piece of a puzzle. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like when you like we're talking to Di Mike Mass, he's, he's like, you know, maybe they're coming back. And then we're talking, we're, you know, listening to stories about these Nordics. And I'm like, man, these Nordics, the like description of the Nordics Sure, sound a lot like the you know the Anunnaki that Freddie talks about, and then I'm like, man, I, and then I start to go. I'm like, I wonder if this is something, you know, if we compare it with Dr. Mike Masters' theories, where it's like maybe they're coming back, and at that point in time they got stuck. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And they're like, so that that's why they didn't, you know, like Freddie says, they would help, but they didn't want to influence too much because they're like, we shouldn't be here, right? Yeah. I don't so. It's just I love I love the, all the theories. It's just fun. Yeah, it's a I, I really enjoy talking to Freddie. I, I did have a slight delay for some reason halfway through that. I I was probably on a three second delay. Oh, to like to listening to him. Yeah, like a three second audio delay. Probably thirty minutes in, I was like, oh, I know I'm delayed. Shit. Damn. <laughs> That's all right. That's all good. But he, whatever. You ask him a question, you get twenty minutes answer. It's perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's like you have time for like four or five questions and you're like, again, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be the whole thing. <laughs> well, the, what's great about the I've said this before. The great thing about how he speaks is he I will ask a question. He will start talking as he starts talking. I will pop up more questions in my head, but he will answer them almost as before. Yeah. <laughs> As he goes, and I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, okay, 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 yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, yeah. well, because I'm sure I, well, he's written the book, so it's like, 
he thinks that, you know, that a lot of people think that way where it's like, you're going to answer all the questions, like the natural progression of questions. I'm sure yes. he's like, he anticipates those and, he's and he got just, them, it, like his whole answer goes into all that, like this and this and this and this. Yeah. He, he does that uh, pretty well. Uh, I can't, I can't wait to have a drink with the guy in person. I yeah, would, that'd be fine. You could, I bet you could sit down for four hours and he would just talk and you'd be drinking with him and he'd just go into so many details he wouldn't talk about on the show. Yeah. Oh yeah. He said the, he says if we could plan enough beer, we can get that book. He says we probably couldn't, but we could. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we can, we can We're get, get that book. We're gonna get yeah. that damn book. <laughs> we could get that book. He doesn't know how hard we party. <laughs> uh we'll be getting the fucking declaration of independence with Freddie Silva. <laughs> um it's it's a it's kind of disappointing that he's not going to be able to attend the contact and the stuff only because the one panel that we that we're doing when they gave us a decision to be like, which one do you want to do? We're like, whatever one Freddie Silva's on. <laughs> I, it's it's weird that they put him on that one though. Cause that panel is like, it's ancient aliens and human origins, right? I so know. The the well, I guess and he it's like, fits in the human origins. Human origins. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, he doesn't fit in with the other, no, you know, this he, does, is, he doesn't, doesn't fit like in with the other UFO, like the, the others, like the UFO crowd and Freddie Silva is more like ancient civilizations, lost civilizations. He, he yeah. doesn't, knowledge he stuff, doesn't like and, the ancient astronaut hypothesis yeah he doesn't no. like their theories really the ufo aliens it's like everything was us or you know somebody some version who were here on earth already uh some at some o- point some other hominid species like that that's what his theory is like some other hominid species evolved before us got wiped out by the cataclysm some right. of the remnants spread spread across the earth reinst like started us like our civilization i guess is that's the theory right which is cool um, i mean that it it probably makes more sense I mean, scientifically than aliens, like really. Yeah. Like if there was, we just haven't found the bones yet. They're all underwater or who fucking knows. Well, you know, like, it's, it's, you know, like I said, a piece of the puzzle, it's like you, you talk about Hugh, Hugh Newman does all the research into like finding these giants, right? Like he never finds, right? and he it's never like, really finds them though. He never really finds them, but his <laughs> things is like, he's looking into these, you know, reports of giants and, you know, ancient talking of giants and then Freddie's like, hey, these things were big. Eight, they're eight, eight and a half feet tall. I mean, that's Well, that's here's a the thing. How do we books. know they were eight feet tall? Because my thing is this. This was the other thing that popped in my head I, for, I forgot. Is like, if we're talking about weight, it's, it's, it's pretty much a fact that like, w- you know, in our evolution, we've grown taller and taller and taller. Um, but like, you know, back 200 though, years ago, like, 200 years ago, you know, a lot shorter, right? Yeah, tall guy I was wonder like five, if, eight. If we went back, if we went back to like, if you time traveled me back to young Gadrius and I just popped out and there's humans, would I look like a fucking giant of a human, like well-fed, you know, thick, thick as a bowl of pudding, <laughs> right? Well, it would also, de- it also depend on a lot on your diet. Like if you popped out, cause it's a lot of, a lot of our diets are, you know, we have. Not not the fact that like we eat better food, even though we eat a lot of like there's processed lot, food. There's a lot of like bad that. food, but a lot of better food. But we do eat a lot of like we eat a lot better food here generally. Um, we have healthier lifestyle than before. Um, you're not subject to any like childhood diseases or anything like no. that. Uh, but you know those kinds of things. Um, but would I look huge, Dan? Would these people go like? Holy shit! At six feet, would would I be? Would I tower over these people? I, you, I don't. Think I don't think so. so. I don't think you'd be. T- you'd be a tall. Per- you'd be like a head. You'd be a head above. At, look at like Maasai warrior. Look like a Maasai culture in Africa. Those guys are all huge. Uh, yeah, they're I guess like, six they're, four. They're jacked. Yeah, and they're mostly living in like still kind of Stone Age huts, mostly. So it's like I don't. I don't think so. It, no one's mistaking me for Anunnaki unless I'm on stilts. No. They're just going to be like, oh, my God, you just Do gave I'm- birth to some naked gorilla. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> my second point, because I have blue eyes, am I, ha- am I part Anunnaki? Possibly. Is Zell no, full <laughs> Anunnaki? Am I full Anunnaki? <laughs> Look how glistening his These skin is These questions and more on the next Alien Theories. <laughs> <laughs> These questions and answers is more. Uh-huh. Next Alien Theories, their eyes. I do not have the secrets to the universe. I, therefore, am not Anunnaki. Yet. 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 You just need another decade of um, visions popping into your head and write them down. We should I paper. Okay, it's so it's funny. Um I cuz I've been waiting to tell you guys about this guy, but it kind of popped up there. Um so I know this guy in town. Recently sure. know him. Uh he was going to call into a Cosmic Channels and then he just was like, "Uh, eh. he's very eccentric." 
Mm-hmm. Interesting guy. Super smart. Like, super smart. Detail-oriented. Uh, like, there's draft designs, architecture. And he he's, like, when he found out that, like, I'm, like, you know, in the alien world, let's say, he <laughs> is, he knows everything. He's read, like, every book by everyone. And he's, like, I'm so interested in it. And he says he's interested in it because he's been getting these visions. And he has designs for some sort of propulsion system. Unfinished. That he, he he just gets. They just come to him. He doesn't understand it. And ever since he started getting them, he's been researching on everything to do with UFOs and aliens. And he has these, like, partial designs. Uh, and he, he was, like, explaining to me, like, how he thinks it might work. And he's like, I just so he's I'm been just, researching. He's been spending all this time researching aliens and UFOs when he should be researching like how propulsion works. If he has no idea how it works. Well, no, no the thing is, is the, he says the design isn't finished. He's like, right. he's like, I know from the visions that they're giving them to me in sections, and I will eventually get the the final pieces to it. And he's got like five pieces of this design. And then he now, draws he's never them. he's never worked in a propulsion. No, he's not. Uh, he doesn't. He's he not doesn't, an engineer. He's not a mechanical engineer. No. Okay. Uh, Has and he had a mechanical engineer look at it because they might be able to kind of figure out what it does. He's not supposed to. He doesn't. He's not. He's. It's like it's for him. He's oh, not right. It's share. for him only. Yeah, I got yeah. you. Okay, it's one he's of waiting, those. He's waiting. He's waiting for. It. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but he's a super interesting guy, and the drawings are very interesting. You're like, hmm. I'm like. In my head, like when I'm like looking at them and stuff, I'm like, "Why would you just draw? Like, is he we just draw these to make this up? Like, they look really good and they're detailed." I'm like, "What? Like, like he's? It looks like he's drawing plants. It, like, when you look at it, you're like, these look like plans to build something, dude. Like, I'm I don't not really gonna, know. Well, why. I mean, he's an architect, so he knows how to draft things. I mean. Yes, yes. But I'm saying is, <laughs> why would you go through all this work to just be like, this is? I just like to tell you know a handful of people." about this not a lot of people like so, like his daughters know and like a couple other people because he's like oh, I don't want it's he doesn't want it. he's like it's like almost like it's embarrassing for him to show people well he needs right? a pro- so it's not he like it's a prototype so he's not it's not like he's like he's like like perpetuating a hoax or anything you know what i mean like what would he gain from just telling me you know what i mean like it's like which is yeah, and that's cool. I just hope he understands like the process of building a new once he gets it completed, like what the process of building a new propulsion system means. Like there's gonna have to be testing, there's gonna have to be all that stuff. Like, is he gonna be Fired involved? In the with, does he plan to be involved with that? Or he's just gonna be like, I'm gonna put what, what if it's a bomb? What if it how does he know it's a propulsion? What if it's not like some world ending antimatter world bomb? <laughs> yeah. Like how does he know that? How does he know for sure one hundred percent it's a propulsion he's been given system? A, uh, he's, he, I, I think he's been like from my understanding oh, what of what it, he's told oh, me. What if it's an interdimensional portal and they just want him to open it up so they can invade the planet? Like, yeah. fuck, like, I don't know. Like, Fucking maybe you should have people Avengers look at this and actually style. know what, how, what these things work. <laughs> yeah, don't fire it up right away. <laughs> Call Kurt Russell first. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And fucking well, James Spader. Hopefully he finishes it off and shows us first. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, man, this is a chaos warp gate, dude. Fucking unnamed horrors are going to come through here. Fucking tentacles and mouths right. and eyeballs all over their bodies. And then we're all going to be corrupted. And then when are you going to do then? The warp's going to consume Earth. And nothing can save us except for the glory of the emperor. So what are you going to do then? I would love to sit here and chat with you guys. The only problem is these midday pods for me, it is 40 degrees in my room here. It's fair. And I'm sweating. I've got like... I've got my shirt up. My nips are out. <laughs> like I literally, my shirt is only up high that's, enough so you can't see the skin. But it's the like optimal cooling position. Is yeah, above it's, nips. it's like. so hot in here, man. I'm absolutely dying. I look like a shiny one. And it's all sweat, <laughs> glistening sweat. All so right. that confirms that you are one of the shiny ones. You heard it here, Bart Anunnaki. All right, let's I end it. Guess. That was fun. All right, all right. thanks everyone. Uh, it's uh, Contact in the Desert interview series part. Four. We may have a couple more parts uh, coming your way. We at least have two, maybe three. At least two more, maybe three, maybe four, maybe six, we don't maybe know. two, maybe none. Yeah. The future, only the future knows. You're gonna get what you're gonna get, and you're gonna like yeah. it. And you're gonna, and you're like gonna it. suck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Peace. Keep those eyes on the skies. Keep up to date with all things alien theorist theorizing. Follow us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. 
For updates on new videos and content on YouTube, don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing.